I'm Matt Pfeiffer, and I'm the director of The Christians by Lucas Nath. Well, Lucas is, I think, one of the more dynamic playwrights uh, working in the American theater today. He does this um, really amazing thing of uh, writing very realistic circumstances, but there is a sort of an elevated theatricality around a lot of what he writes, and the mixture of those two is so the mixture of those two elements are so seamless that his cha his plays are both challenging and familiar. And I am someone who grew up in a family of faith and as an adult uh, have struggled with that faith. And so I think Lucas is writing from a, a similar perspective that I have had in my own life of what does it mean to be uh, faithful to a particular God or to a particular religion and, and the kind of modern struggles that one can face uh, when trying to find what the substance of their faith is in modern life. And so when I first heard of the play, I thought the idea of a, a church service that explored questions of faith uh, in a theatrical setting was, was a pretty uh, exciting challenge. And the writing of the, uh, Lucas's writing um, is so compelling that I, I, I felt really drawn to trying to figure out how to put that on stage. I think the play does transcend particular faiths. I don't think it's about Christianity necessarily. I think it is about, I think all religions, I think anyone who has been raised in, in a religious environment um, has questioned their faith. You know, I always admire that, um, you know, Jewish people wrestle with their faith. Uh, there, there's a lot of wrestling with God and, and Catholicism tends to be a little bit more um, strict. Uh, you know, I, I, I have 16 years of Catholic education uh, that that I experienced a lot of rigidity. Um, and I think the play touches on both those things. So whether, no matter what you believe, I'm sure everyone encounters uh, conflict with with church doctrine, whether that, you know, whatever, whatever faith you might be. And so the core struggle that uh, the characters in the play are, are, are grappling with has to do with... Um, why you choose to believe what you believe. So to me, that's non-denominational, that belief and faith transcend uh, a specific religion. Why didn't you tell me earlier that you disagreed with my sermon? Why didn't you tell me earlier that you were going to deliver that sermon? Why didn't you tell me earlier that you were going to forcibly change what our church believes? Whether you, whether you are a member of a religion or have been a member of a religion, I think is actually irrelevant to the play. I think that people on a daily basis struggle with listening to their own moral compass. What is that voice inside of you that, that is telling you how to live a more virtuous life, how to live a better life? Um, and when we give way to our lesser, our lesser self, the, the sort of, you know, the devil on our shoulder, and when we give way to, to um, sin, you know, whether or not we have received sin through religion or just our own sense of right and wrong, uh, the play is very much about that. The play is, has way more to do with why you should be a good person <laughs> and what is that voice you listen to. And there's a, there's a notion of the play that it's hard to differentiate if you are a person of faith. It's hard to differentiate what is the voice of God and what is your own self-interest. And so I think that that speaks to people whether they are members of, of a faith or not. Well, we're, you know, we've transformed Bristol Riverside Theater's stage into a church, uh, and that's a pretty tremendous challenge. Um, the, Lucas calls for the play essentially to be a sermon, uh, both in in realistic fashion and in a sort of a poetical theatrical fashion. And so the challenge of the 
play is that it never really shifts location, even though sometimes the story shifts location. The play jumps time, even though the way the audience will receive the play in real time, they might not discern uh, that time has passed unless they're listening to the text. So there is a a huge challenge in creating a grounded, realistic church space, but then also allowing it to move through time and space fairly fluidly. Um, That's really challenging. It's almost always easier if you say, oh, well, now we're in the office and an office comes on stage, or, oh, now we're in a bedroom and a bed comes on stage. To sort of create that kind of imagery in an audience's mind purely using the text is like Shakespeare. Um, and, and that to me is a tremendous challenge. There's also, because the play is taking place sort of like a church sermon, uh, having actors be on microphone, handheld microphones the entire time is something I've never experienced. Uh, you know, even when you're doing a play where actors have, you know, microphones over their ears or something, it's, it's an, it's an inactive choice for the actors, as opposed to once you have a microphone in your hand, it does all sorts of different things to inform the action. I've never put a play like that on stage. Uh, so that's really challenging and it's, it's really exciting. The, the, this, the, the church setting of the play is a mega church. And so we're trying to allude to a much larger space than is here at, at BRT. Um, and we're also trying to allude to a church that has a higher level of technical proficiency. So you'll see there are, are big TV screens in this church. Um, we also wanted to suggest that there was some canned production, if you will. Uh, so instead of having a live organ, there are much more uh, blown out recorded tracks that the choir sings to. Uh, And all that was to attempt to suggest that this church does have a theatricality to it, as many churches do. You know, the overlap between the origins of theater uh, essentially starting from religious ceremony, that was really the birth of the theater art form, was, you know, the shaman putting on a play to explain why the sun came up and went away. so there is there has always been this overlap of of theater and religious ceremony um, that are that have, that you know have been in concert and Lucas is creating something that uh, attempts to do both of those things at the same time and so um, having a live choir that can fully sing but the accompaniment is uh, is more controlled uh, is something that was of great interest to me and and Mike Kylie the sound designer so that's been a lot of fun you know is also working with this awesome community choir and uh, you know some of them have never been in a play before some of them have never sung in front of people before and so trying to create an environment that allowed them to be their best selves was another huge factor in in trying to create the dynamic around the church service at this particular church. Well, this is my first time working um, with this kind of program. You know, Susan Atkinson, the, the founding producer here at BRT, you know, went and studied with Cornerstone Theater, which for those of us who work in the theater, um, it is a tremendous uh, inspiration to Cornerstone, goes into communities and creates plays with people in communities all, all over the country. And so Susan has brought that skill set to bear in working with this community choir. And because the play has so much to do with the lifeblood of this, the community of, of this, of this uh, church, having real people from Bristol be a part of the production, I think really grounds the play in a way that would be hard to do in any other, uh, any other style. And so the combination of having real people from Bristol uh, in the production elevates, I think, everything we're doing and the work that Susan has done with them and to create that community is, uh, is really impressive. Um, yeah, I got my equity card here back in 2001 in a production of A Moon for the Misbegotten that Susan Atkinson directed and Keith Baker starred in. And, uh, you know, there's, um, there's a, an expression that I, I heard before the start of this play, which is, you know, God doesn't tell you everything at once for a reason. And uh, if, if I had known back in 2001 that my, my life in the theater would take me to becoming a director and ultimately coming back here and staging a play on this stage where I got my equity card oh so many years ago, uh, that, that I would say that, that bears out to be true, that God doesn't tell you everything at once for a reason because you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, I, I hope that what the audience comes in and finds is a really unique theater experience unlike anything they've ever seen before. And, you know, one of the great things about theater, especially in the 21st century, where we are able to be really in our own bubbles most of the time and we can watch Game of Thrones on our phones at 12 o'clock at night and, and not have to share any of those experiences with anybody, um, there's something really great about the theater still being a place where... Um, People come together to experience something all at once. You know, the great playwright Tracy Letts says, uh, you know, we get to say it to their face. And I feel like that is a unique thing about the theater, that it's still a place where people come together to have a, a shared experience, which is very much like church, uh, where people still gather together to give thanks to a higher belief. And I think that hopefully that is something that will, will stand out uh, for people when they come to see the play that this feels like a theatrical event um, that you just couldn't experience anywhere other than in a theater. Oh, I wish